Coming to you live from the Mediaplex in downtown Windsor, this is a presentation of St. Clair College Journalism. Good evening, Windsor-Essex. I'm Mark Brown, and you're watching Mediaplex News Now. Winter has arrived with a vengeance, and reporter Kayla Wang has some driving tips to help us cope with the cold. Local police are taking the time to remind drivers that with the cold weather approaching, there are ways to keep safe while driving. Constable Andrew Julout of the Windsor Police giving some tips for drivers about driving safety. Clear ice from the windshields. It's also important for them to leave more time in getting to their destination, drive a little bit more slowly, and um, it's also important to leave more space in between the vehicle in front of you so that if you have to make a quick stop, you will be able to do so. For cars, local mechanic Nick Papetta says it's important to check and prepare your car in winter. Likely advise snow tires. I'll be checking the antifreeze to make sure it's strong enough. I'll be checking the wiper blades to see that they work properly. I'll be checking the anti-lock brake system because uh, anti-lock brakes are a big part of winter safety. Police department also used social media to make announce about what happened. We utilize social media very frequently to let drivers know what's happening in the city, whether that be car accidents that are at a specific location in the city so that they can avoid that area and make alternate arrangements. Reporting for Mediaplex News, I'm Kayla Wong. Well, somebody had to go outside on this cold evening, and we picked Sean Preble. How are you surviving, Sean? Well, right now I'm surviving in a bone-chilling minus 7 degrees, but it's a pretty clear night out here. Tonight we'll be dipping down to about minus 13 with some partly cloudy skies, but we could see some snow in the forecast tomorrow, and I'll explain that more in my extended forecast later in the show. Back to you in the studio, Mark. Many take a warm place to sleep for granted, but many others aren't quite so fortunate. Sean Preble reports. As the sun sets on warmer temperatures in Windsor, not everyone can go inside to stay warm. When the winter arrives, those who are homeless have to seek shelter where they can. But there are organizations which are trying to help keep people warm and fed. Ron Dunn with the Windsor Downtown Mission says they've been able to help those without a home thanks to the public. We're putting out 726 meals a day on average here at the Mission now. And uh, that's all based on the generosity of other people. You know, if you're looking for a Christmas miracle story, that's it. And for people like John Lewis, the help is appreciated. It feels good because you're helping, people are helping other people. The mission is not the only place for those who are homeless. The Welcome Center Shelter for Women is also there providing 12 beds for women facing homelessness. They are able to provide safe, confidential housing, clothing, food, and other necessities in an emergency. Donations are always welcome as they also have an emergency food bank for up to 1,000 families. Remy Bobo with the center says if people want to donate, it can come in many forms. You know, if you don't have money to give, give your stuff. If you don't have stuff to give, give your time. And if you don't have time to give, then give your thoughts. But Angela Yukonich with the Homeless Coalition of Windsor-Essex County says though the holidays are important, residents should remember to donate even when they're over. Everybody wants to help somebody because it's Christmas time. The reality of it is homelessness and poverty is a year-round issue. The coalition will be conducting a point-in-time count several times at the beginning of the new year. Volunteers will go out and count how many sheltered and unsheltered homeless people there are in a single night. For Mediaplex News Now, I'm Sean Preble. Ron Dunn is with the Downtown Mission and he is our guest in studio today. Hello, I'm David Dyke, and you're watching 3 Minutes with Ron Dunn, who is the Executive Director of Windsor's Downtown Mission. Now, Ron, with uh, Windsor's unemployment rate having climbed uh, recently to 9.6%, I imagine that would have contributed to uh, homelessness in Windsor as well. Um, what kind of increase in demands have you seen at the, uh, at the Downtown Mission? Well, we don't know if there's a direct link between the unemployment rate and homelessness, but we do know that there's more people living in poverty. Many of them are the working poor, and obviously the unemployment rate affects the, how they live as well. So all of our programs are really swelling uh, to capacity at this moment. Okay. I imagine there'd also be a, a need for a, an increase in uh, food supplies as well. Um, what kind of uh, previous uh, food supplies have you had coming in and some of your donators and uh, what do you hope to increase as well yet? Well, Windsor Essex has always treated us very well, but you are right. Because we're helping that many more people, the demand for food is higher. So we're still getting the same amount of food in, but we're seeing more people come through our programs. So we are at an all-time low at this moment. 
Okay. Yeah. Who are some of your uh, suppliers, by, suppliers by this point? Well, all of our suppliers are the folks of Windsor Essex. So um, most of our, if not all of our gifts, come in um, from regular people. They go out and do their shopping, and they grab a couple extra cans of something. There's some businesses that help us out, um, you know, through drives at school and church groups and, and anybody. Um, you know, say the Mediaplex, for example, could do a, a nice drive for us. Okay. Ron, I imagine, I, I heard that there, was a, there would be a 24-hour service now being provided via downtown Mission. Um, does, that need, does that mean there needs to be now an increase in, a, in a, um, volunteers uh, regularly at the, uh, at the Mission as well? Yeah, we actually um, started October 1st as a 24-hour uh, service provider. What that means is now nobody has to leave and we have programs running 24 hours a day. And from a volunteer perspective, that means we've asked the public to step forward even more and, and give us more of their time. So the 6 o'clock soup program, for example, requires anywhere between four to six new individuals that we didn't have before. So we're working that out right now. Okay. Um, I imagine also that I heard now that visitors were also allowed to come and stay for the whole day, whereas previously they were only able to stay for the morning. Um, does that mean there's going to be more group activities during the day as well? Or? Yeah, we're actually exploring programs right now, actually. All of our programs are kind of being reviewed and uh, looking for what's the best way to operate them and how to expand them as well. So that's in process right now with my uh, management team. What kind of uh, group activities have you been holding up to this point already? Well, we do a lot of art. November 25th, for example, we have a, an art show, which is um, at the mission, and it's folks who have, are using our programs and have gone through an art program trying to sell some of their own artwork. So it's pretty exciting and it's new. And, um, you know, we're also looking at things like um, counseling, addiction counseling, Bible studies, those types of things as well. All right, Ron, I think that's actually all the time we actually have for today. Um, you've been watching uh, Three Minutes with uh, Ron Dunn, who is the Executive Director for uh, um, Windsor's Downtown Mission. I'm David Dyke, reporting for Mediaplex News Now. Windsor is the place to be for robotics and robotic competitions. Let's join Dan Gray with a special guest. Thank you, Mark. I'm here with Eric Kuzmiracek. Eric is the Director of Partnerships at WeTech Alliance in Windsor. He is also the point man for a lot of the stuff they do with FIRST Robotics. Thank you for joining us, Eric. Well, thank you very much for having me. What is FIRST Robotics? Well, FIRST Robotics is a international high school robotics competition wherein students of uh, teams of 20 to 30 students work with professional engineers, programmers, uh, designers to dream up, design, and build 120-pound robots that compete against each other inside an arena. It's a uh, program that is supported by about 3,000 companies worldwide, including half of all Fortune 500 companies, companies like Boeing, Bombardier, Google, Microsoft, General Motors, Chrysler, uh, you name it, because uh, they see this as a way to cultivate the next generation of engineers, programmers, technology entrepreneurs that will fuel our economy here uh, regionally and, and globally. So what is it with this first robotics competition? What is their goal this year? Last year it was to stack recycling bins. Well, this year is a sort of castle, storm the castle kind of, or capture the flag uh, um, component to it. Uh, there's going to be a lot more uh, participation from the audience as well. Uh, Windsor is actually host uh, to the largest FIRST Robotics regional tournament in Canada. So we expect 1,500 high school participants on 52 teams from across North America. And uh, as well, we're actually going to be hosting the first team from Europe that are booking their tickets to compete uh, in this competition as well. So it's a truly international competition and it's open to the public. So what is it that the students gain from an experience like this? Do they get recruited for universities, et cetera? You know, for the students, this is, uh, for them it's an experience. It's like running their own uh, technology startup company. So they get to, they get experience and skills when it comes to mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, computer programming, but also in terms of business plans, uh, in terms of graphic design, communications, PR, they are running a technology startup company. So this is a invaluable experience for them moving forward. Thank you for joining us today, Eric. It was wonderful to hear about First Robotics, and we look to ha forward to having you in here shortly again soon. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate it. David Mouche is the president and CEO at Windsor Regional Hospital, and he joins us in studio with reporter Linda Colleen Morgan. Thank you for joining us, David. My first question is, what is the current status of Windsor Regional Hospital, uh, the new facility? Well, we're in a five-stage process towards a new facility, and we're at stage one. So we're really early on in the process, but we're at a very critical part of the process because when you move to stage two, 
you take away the if you're going to have a new facility because right now we're at an early stage but we're still at the if and when phase meaning if we're going to have a new facility and when we're going to have a new facility once we move to stage two the if is gone just a matter of when so we're at a critical part but at an early part and i was wondering if you could tell me about the proposed status of the location well, the site selection committee went through a rather uh, thorough process uh, over the last uh, 18 months to 24 months to end up with the preferred site for the new uh, acute care hospital. But in addition to that, what was announced this past July was investments and in also the former Grace site, the Olette site, and the Tafor site. So it's not just the new acute care site that's been announced, it's also a whole system change. And that's what's really exciting uh, for the community and has garnered a lot of support is the systems transformation that the announcement uh, undertook. And David, what do you feel that some of the advantages are for the new hospital's location? Well, with respect to the new, new location, one of the things the Minister of Health made it very clear to us when we started the process is that we had to take into the regional aspect of this new facility. So when we were picking site, we had to pick a site for the region. One of the unique things we have for our region is the county and the city are split about 54% in the city, 46% in the county. A lot of areas across the province will have say 85% city and 15% county like London does. So maybe it's a little easier to locate a site. But for us, we had to locate it for the, uh, for the region. So the site that was picked by the site selection in my committee does just that along with the other investments that are taking place in the downtown core and also at the TAFOR campus. Um, and I was wondering if you could tell me about the old facilities. How many beds are in those facilities and how many beds are going to be in the, the new facility? So we have approximately 500 acute care beds in both Olette and the Metropolitan campus. When we move to the new facility, oh, just over 500 beds. Um, that does not take into account acute mental health. A lot of people get caught up is that when we move to the new facility, we're going to start with just as many beds we have now and moving towards over 700 beds with respect to the population projections that are taking place in our community over the next 20 years. 60 of the acute care beds are moving from Olette and going to be going to TAFOR. So overall, we have the same amount of beds. There is not a decrease in beds and projected to grow over the next 20 years. And do you believe that this facility, um, the new one, will be enough to support not only Windsor, but the region as well? It has to. It's going to be a game changer also to have all of those services in the new facility, um, a new acute care facility, a state-of-the-art facility. If you go to our website, windsorhospitals.ca, you'll see other similar facilities in Humber, in Oakville, that have been just opening this year that are phenomenal and Windsor-Essex deserves nothing less, and some of the benefits of those facilities are amazing for uh, those communities as well as what we're going to have in ours. And I want to thank you, David. I'm Lindy Colleen Morgan, and back to you, Mark. Some people in our community are not happy with the location of the hospital. Sean Preble explains. Thanks, Mark. Stephen Pittman from the Citizens for an Accountable Mega Hospital Planning Process joins us here in the studio tonight. Now, Camp has been vocal against the chosen location of the new mega hospital, which is being built on County Road 42 and Concession 9. Thank you for joining us, Stephen. Thanks so much for having me here, Sean. So this is supposed to be a regional hospital. Mm. Uh, what are your organization's concerns about the chosen location? Well, I would ask you what the hospital today is called, and that's Windsor Regional Hospital. So I think that we can have a, a regional hospital that is still located in the core of, uh, of Windsor. Now, when the announcement started, uh, I believe it was in about July that they announced where it would be. Right. Um, when it was announced, they also announced an urgent care center that was going mm -hmm. to be at the Old Grace site. Mm -hmm. They announced changes to Hotel Duke Grace Healthcare. Yes. Why do you feel that those announcements uh, perhaps is not enough to take care of the need? Right. So I think uh, the underlying message here is that, uh, and this has been reported on, is that 
Uh, this really signals new development, uh, redevelopment, at a time when Windsor desperately needs re redevelopment instead of new development. Um, and it's really distressing for people like myself who go to school to discuss some of these topics, uh, for there to be such a difference between what we're learning and for what we're seeing out there uh, in Windsor. And certainly at a time when Windsor, uh, when the downtown core needs, needs our help, uh, I think we're really taking the wrong action by, by bringing the mega hospital to where, to where it's going to be or where it's proposed to go. Uh, and where uh, where do you think it really needs to be? Uh, I would I would say any location that's in in the core uh, in the core of Windsor. Um, we need to think about how we're going to retain economic activity, and we need to think about more metrics uh, than simply having a centralized location. There's there's far much more going on, and we need to consider that. Well, thank you so much for joining us here today, Stephen. It Excellent. definitely gives people a lot to think about. Mm -hmm. uh, this was Stephen Pittman from the Citizens for an Accountable Mega Hospital Planning Process. Now, I'll leave it back to you, Mark. Thanks, Sean. Windsor Mayor Drew Dilkins dropped by the studio last week for our winter launch program and spoke with Ashley Ann Mentley. I'm here with Windsor Mayor Drew Dilkins. Thank you for joining us. My pleasure, Ashley. So, Mayor Dilkins, as we start 2016, your second year in office, what are your priority issues for Windsor? Well, when I look at uh, the state of our city right now, employment, of course, is still a big issue. We have a high unemployment rate that we're trying to, uh, to tackle, uh, to bring down to at least the provincial average or lower. And so our focus really will be uh, continuing to tackle that employment rate, looking for new investment, new opportunity. Uh, excited to get a new CEO on board at the uh, Windsor Essex Economic Development Corporation. Excited to hire two, uh, two and a half full-time uh, folks uh, in our office, the half being a, a part-time assistant. Uh, and of course, a sports tourism person, getting them on board because that's all related to economic development. And for 2016, I think we have some exciting things coming up with the, uh, the FINA Games happening in December of this year. Uh, real, a real world-class event going to be happening in our city, going to bring uh, participants from 170 countries uh, from around the globe uh, to the city of Windsor, a broadcast-ready event that will be broadcast to more than a billion people uh, on the planet, hosted right here in the city of Windsor. Uh, so there's a whole number of things that are happening, include the, uh, the, including the completion of the East End Pool. Uh, at the WFCU, and I'm excited to, uh, to get that arts endowment going uh, in the city of Windsor too and getting more art, uh, public art, out on the streets and around the city. Sounds like you've got quite the year ahead of you. Um, so what do you see as the city's greatest challenges? Well, certainly, again, uh, employment uh, is an issue. So uh, to the extent that we can continue to diversify our economy, it's a path that was started a number of years ago. And all of the initiatives that we work on, they take two things. They take time and they take money. And, uh, and so, of course, uh, both are in limited, uh, uh, limited supply. So we continue to work on the initiatives where we think we can have the greatest impact. And, of course, continue to support our largest employer, Fiat Chrysler, which, uh, uh, you know, th there's significant employment uh, in the plant uh, with about 5,000 direct jobs. But the nine-to-one spinoff are really important as well so as much as we're looking to attract new business we're also looking to uh, to retain and expand the businesses that we have here in our community absolutely and speaking of fiat chrysler they've just unveiled the pacifica which is the revamp of the minivan how important is that to the future auto sector in our region it's it's uh, i can't I can't even describe the importance because it is absolutely critical uh, to the future of this region. And of course, manufacturing in our city has been the bread and butter for a long, long time. And as much as we, we try and diversify and, and maybe even move ourselves up in the food chain uh, with respect to the automotive industry, we can't lose sight of the fact that uh, that plant employs 5,000 people directly and there's about a nine to one spin-off. So for every job in the plant, there are nine other people in the community in Windsor, Essex that rely on that one job for their employment. So if you just do the math and you look at our population, you realize it's, uh, uh, it's a very significant employer. It's the most significant employer in our community. And, and the fact of the matter is this, uh, this Pacifica that they announced uh, yesterday at the auto show, uh, I think it's, it's going to be a game changer. It's going to keep them here for a long, long time. Uh, we're certainly happy to see the $2 billion investment that they made in the plant uh, here in the city of Windsor, but we're looking longer term. Where are they going to be five or ten years from now? And with this product that they've launched uh, yesterday, I think uh, the future of that, uh, that vehicle and that plant in the city is, is looking pretty good. Perfect. Well, thank you very much for joining us. And Let's go back outside where Sean Preble is now shivering at the corner of University West and Victoria. Sean. Thank you, Mark. It is still very cold out here, but did you know the coldest temperature Windsor saw on record was minus 32.8 degrees back on January 29th, 1973. We luckily won't be seeing temperatures like that anytime this week, but it's still going to get pretty chilly. Tomorrow we will go down to minus 
8 with as scattered flurries hit Windsor. The sun peaks out Thursday with a high of minus 3 and then Friday we'll see a slight warm up to minus 1 but with a mix of cloud and sun. Now let's take a look at our Mediaplex TwitPick of the week. As you can see it gives new meaning to the dog ate my homework. We can see first year journalist Fabrizio Rivera got a photo of his dog after it chewed his recorder and Dave says you're gonna need that recorder soon. That's all for me from here on the corner of University and Victoria. I'm headed back inside to get warm. Back to you, Mark. Former Windsor MP Joe Cole Martin has transitioned from politics to teaching. Shelby Hernandez explains. As one of his many post-retirement endeavors, former Windsor Tecumseh MP Joe Cole Martin will be teaching a seminar at the University of Windsor. All 20 spots have already been filled for the fourth year political science seminar. In this seminar, Cole Martin will discuss the problems he sees with the voting system and the democratic process at the federal level. He will also share his experiences in the House of Commons. Cole Martin says the goal is to eventually find the most promising students who will co-author with him and other faculty members on published research papers. He says more people means more ideas. Also recognizing that I have limitations, I'm, you know, I may not be seeing all of the, the perspectives and so bringing in additional people who hopefully have strong opinions of their own, uh, you can hammer out some of the best solutions for the, for the country. According to political science department head John Sutcliffe, at the university, most professors don't have real world experiences. So although university professors usually require PhDs to teach, Sutcliffe says Comarn's 13 years of experiences make him an exception. Political science student Ronnie Haidar agrees. So instead of like reading it from a book and having the task of imagining how or what it may have been, this is somebody who's gone through it and can tell us the intricate details, can tell us perhaps the things that these books cannot cover or the newspaper articles cannot cover. Although the seminar is full for the winter semester, Comartin says he will be teaching for another two or three years. So for those political science students who thought they lost the opportunity, don't worry, it will come up again. For Mediaplex News, I'm Shelby Hernandez. Where does Windsor rank as a place to live? Sean Preble tells us more. Is Windsor, Essex a good place to live? That's the question posed by an annual report released earlier this fall by the Windsor, Essex Community Foundation. The Vital Signs Survey is released yearly around summertime both in print and online asking residents to rank how they feel about different parts of the community. From transportation to the environment, people in both the city and county rank these sectors with a grade of A to F. Lisa Colodi with the Foundation says the survey is about community engagement. What we're looking for is people to have the voice heard because we want to engage people in their community and help be part of the solution moving forward. But what do residents feel are the best parts of the region? There's a really interesting, very vibrant local art scene. I think the thing I love the most about it is the waterfront right where we are now. You have in Windsor the feel of a, I mean, a big city. Well, small to medium-sized city, but you still have that cordiality of a small town where everybody knows each other, everybody's kind to each other. While people have a lot of positive things to say about Windsor-Essex, one common issue also found in the report is employment. The reason why I didn't move back to Ontario after I finished university was primarily that I knew I likely would not be able to find a job. Career opportunities. Um, Sometimes you can find a job, like an entry-level job, but it's not really going to go anywhere. There isn't really much in the way of uh, startups and new companies coming to Windsor. It's all older industry. Colodi says in order for failing sectors to improve, it will be up to community and business leaders to discover solutions to make the grade next year. So yes, we want the community leaders to take a look at the data, um, organizations that work in those areas, but we also want everyone to take a look at it, to have a conversation about it, and then to get actively engaged. For Mediaplex News Now, I'm Sean Preble. A team of paramedics from St. Clair College are heading overseas to represent Canada. And one of them is joining us live in studio with Sean Preble. 
Thank you, Mark. I am joined here by Chris Kerwin, a member of Team Canada Ontario. So, Mark, what is it you're here to tell us about this competition? Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, just wanted to tell you a little bit about the competition, how we got involved. Uh, the competition's over in the Czech Republic. Uh, it's in May of 2016. Uh, there's a team of four of us from Ontario that will be going over this competition to compete. Uh, we are joining the larger group of Team Canada. Uh, there's another team from Richmond, BC that will be competing alongside of us. And uh, I guess, uh, how, how did you get into this sort of competition? So back in uh, April of 2015, I competed in the National Paramedic Competition and placed uh, first in the Advanced Care Paramedic Division. Um, and because of that opportunity, the coach from Team Canada approached me and asked me if I'd like to put together a team of four paramedics who wanted to uh, go and compete in this competition. What sort of challenges uh, will you be facing in this sort of competition? Yeah, so it's a 24-hour competition. Um, we'll be facing any type of medical challenge uh, anywhere, whether it be outside or inside uh, in a village in the Czech. Um, it could be anything from multiple patients, traumas, anything like that. And just what is uh, much of your team's connection to St. Clair? Yeah, so uh, I myself graduated in 2010 from St. Clair, and uh, two other members of our team, Deanna Owen and uh, Lance Hoover, also graduated from there previously. The fourth member uh, is Nick Montalioni. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Chris. I know that all of us here at the Mediaplex and I'm sure at St. Clair wish you all the best of luck in the competition. Thanks for having me. Back to you, Mark. Local police are going the extra mile to help kids. Jillian Toman has a special guest. Joining us today is Constable Fleming with the Windsor Police. Did you know that since 2002, Windsor Police has sent over 1,000 kids to Camp Bramble? Constable Fleming, can you tell us about the camp? Yeah, so since um, 2002, we've been able to send over 1,000 kids to camp. So boys and girls between the ages of 10 and 12. Um, and we select these kids from our BIP program, so the Values, Influence, and Peers program in our grade 6 schools. So um, students from uh, Windsor and Essex County, so we deal with um, different um, organizations to select these students. And um, we send them to camp for um, a week camp. And uh, we, hold, we hold it out in uh, Kingsville at the Cedar Winds at the Scouts Canada camp. So um, we bring a whole bunch of different activities in for the kids to do um, and we try to make memories for them and um, have a better relationship and have them um, interact with the police officers. That's excellent. And what is your role? Um, so my role, I just actually came into this role at the beginning of the year. So um, my role is to um, raise the funds. So um, Camp Rombo wouldn't happen if we didn't have any um, donors from like corporate sponsors or uh, d donations from our community. So my role is to, you know, get the money in to be able to provide this camp. Um, again, organizing it, bringing all the different um, partnerships, um, be able to give activities for the kids to do. Now, which, um, what would a child uh, you know or, or someone you know, how would they get involved in the camp? Um, so they can contact um, the community services branch for Windsor Police um, and contact myself. We can just, um, it's 509-255-6173 uh, and my extension's 4. And then uh, we can just get a hold of me and I can give all the information out. And is there anything else that you wanted to add? Uh, no, I just, um, being able to, I've attended the camp as a police officer two, for the last two years. And just the uh, response from the kids and the... Um, you know, when they go home with their all their memories and all their friends, that it's um it's nice to see that the impact that Windsor Police has been able to have on these children and listen to their stories afterwards. So it's awesome. That's great. And what is the best thing about your job? Um, just you know, serving the community, working with different communities, working with the kids. Um, that's what we're here for, right? We're here to keep everybody safe and to work with the community and just provide everything that we can do to keep everybody safe. So. And joining us today was Constable Fleming from the Windsor Police. And that's our show for tonight. Good night, everyone, and thanks for tuning in. I'm Mark Brown, and you have been watching Mediaplex News Now. Mediaplex News Now is a production of the St. Clair College Journalism Program.